Welcome to Necetera Stack Tribe. In this episode, called Cultivating Trust, Secure and Responsible Software Engineering, we'll talk about an important topic that impacts all developers developing software secure products with secure code. Joining us today are Lars Myers, an information security expert with 10 plus years in the software industry, specializing in application security, vulnerability management, and comprehensive security assessments. And Corsin de Cortins, a chief technology officer who drives innovation by overseeing technology stacks, development tools, and processes. Welcome. Thanks for having us, Ivana. Hello. So today's topic, as I already mentioned, it's about developing secure software with focus on secure coding. Lars, as an information security expert, could you explain what secure coding actually involves? Yeah, of course. Um, I often like to compare it to, um, to, for example, driving in traffic. So when you first learn how to drive, you, you get you know, an overview of all the rules, what to do, what all the signs mean. Um, and if everybody would just follow the rules exactly, then you know, traffic happens very predictably. Um, of course, in reality, people break rules all the time, might be in a hurry, do different things. So what you also get taught is uh, to drive defensively, which means that instead of just expecting um, the traffic around you to always act the way that they should, you also expect that maybe... If you even if you have priority, you don't get it, or somebody doesn't give it to you. So you drive defensively, and in coding, this is very similar. So instead of always expecting that your application um, is dealing with the data that it expects, with is being handled the way it expects, um, your code should also uh, take into account uh, and and be able to deal with unexpected situations, unexpected inputs. So. This is relevant for all developers, not just information security experts, right? Kursin, how do developers learn to code securely? Is it something that everyone just knows or is it taught at university? I guess it depends a lot on the universities. Some have that on their curriculum. In some universities, the focus is more on, on algorithms and data structures, not so much on secure coding. So I think a lot of the developers actually learn this when they start working in a, in a real company, uh, in a real project team um, from their peers, from, from senior engineers, um, through pair programming, uh, code reviews and things like that. Um, um, and of course, there's also dedicated education offerings that, that you can uh, do in addition to university courses. Uh, focusing explicitly on on secure coding and security aspects. Yeah, there's also um, things like secure coding competitions that you could use and and that we see teams using. So this kind of gamifies the whole uh, secure coding, uh, which can be a big motivator. Um, but yeah, I agree with with Corson there. I think most of the experience happens with the developers as they progress in their career and get more experience. Um, and of course, yeah, if you're curious, there, there are lots of good sources online. Um, OWASP, a big organization, publishes these cheat sheets. Uh, they contain really a lot of information about uh, how to apply secure coding practices. And is the secure coding the same regardless of the technology stack, whether it's front-end or back-end, web or mobile? And do all these teams that work uh, follow the same rules and the same practices, of course? Well, of course, uh, each technology stack is is different and uh, comes maybe with some of its own challenges. And it's always very important when designing software, of course, to be aware of, of the environment that your software runs in. So if you imagine a software that is running in a backend server, uh, this is a protected environment only accessible to a few people within a company. Uh, compare that to a code that is running in your browser or in your mobile phone. Um, there are quite a, a, a few different aspects that you should take into account as a developer there. Yeah, I think in the details there, there are lots of differences, but the basic principles, the, the processes that you need to set up, they are essentially the same, whether it's Android, iOS, front-end, back-end. Um, it's important that every developer sees this as his or her responsibility 
to produce secure code and to really take care of these aspects and that it's embedded in the procedures within the team with pair programming, with reviews, uh, check-in reviews, code reviews, whatever you do in, in the software team, that this is really part of daily life. And of course, that the teams also make use of tools as much as possible, static and dynamic code analyzers that help with finding security issues within the code bases. Of course, they are, again, platform-specific, stack-specific, but capture the kind of the similar ideas um, and provide the similar functionality. And why would you say we need dedicated information security specialists? Do they only handle like operations or do they also support product teams, for example, during the development? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think, first of all, it's, it's always good to have an independent party that can look at the code from kind of a new, fresh perspective. Um, it's also good that um, us as a, as a department kind of have only that major focus to focus on security. And often as a developer, there's uh, many other aspects in a project that, uh, that can take up your time. Um, additionally, I think because we are part of, um, of Netcetera and, and we work very closely with the development teams, um, this also allows us to sit together with the developers and discuss uh, what we see in their code and how they could improve this uh, themselves in the future. So their collaboration between, uh, between the two teams is really essential. Yeah, and it's great to have this central team, but it's really important to, to note that as a software team, as a product team, you cannot delegate this away to, to Lars and to his team. As nice as that would be, in the end, it's always the product teams who are responsible for the security. The central infrastructure, information security team, they help a lot and, and the tools help a lot, but in the end, it's really the software team that is responsible. And that, yeah. You can't change that. So you've described shortly how teams handle secure coding. But how do they determine if they've done it well? How would they know if they've completed their task correctly? Who approves the security of a product? Is there any certification? Who certifies its security? Well, that's a tricky bit of uh, about software. Um, yeah, of course, you can conduct pen tests and you can do all kinds of proactive measures to uh, reduce the likelihood of your, your software having, uh, having security flaws. But these are no guarantees. Uh, there are many such things. So we conduct also security pen tests inside uh, in our company. Um, there's also certifications, compliance or regulations, and all of these elements are useful and they can focus on, on different aspects of the software development lifecycle. But none of those things can give you a 100% guarantee that you do not have any vulnerabilities. And what if there are vulnerabilities in your code? Well, this is not really a question or if, it's, it's really a question of when. Um, every code has uh, flaws. Um, some of them will be security relevant flaws. And really the goal here is to be able to detect them before uh, the bad people do. So it's, it, first of all, very good to have this awareness and to know that, okay, my software isn't perfect, but I do take care of trying to detect flaws early enough and make it part of my uh, development cycle to improve those flaws as I find them. And it's also important not just to, to focus on the flaws and try to avoid them, but also, you know, accept the fact that there will be flaws and there will be exploited. So be ready for that. Um, take this into account, set up processes, set up responsibilities in the team. W what happens if, if uh, um, a threat is actually exposed and, and someone is using it to, to attack you? I think that's another important part. It's not just about trying to avoid them. Uh, as Lars said, I mean, you have vulnerabilities, you can do whatever you want, there will be vulnerabilities in your code, and you have to be ready that they are um, exploited at some point. Yeah, and that's that's definitely right, and, and that's also where the collaboration comes in again. So we are not just there to support the teams when they are developing or when we are doing the test and we find uh, certain flaws. We are also there to, to support them when actually something happens, right? We are there then to analyze what the cause of the problem is, what the quickest ways to mitigate uh, the, the flaw that has been detected are, and really support the teams in handling this as well. And with so many people and teams involved in such incidents, how do you ensure that they will and they collaborate effectively? 
Um, well, coordination of security incidents are handled by the SOC, the Security Operations Center. Uh, this is also part of the InfoSec uh, department. Um, of course, there are also a difference between like minor incidents and, and, and bigger incidents. Minor incidents are often just have, uh, handled by the teams themselves. Um, as soon as then a major incident um, happens, then we get to coordinate with many different departments. So then uh, the information security department comes in, the application teams come in, uh, maybe system engineering, uh, corporate, legal, all kinds of entities could be involved uh, to look at different aspects of an incident. Um, of course, the first goal there is always to put out the fire to make sure that everything is under control. Um, but um, the, the more important aspect then is how to learn from that event and to uh, move on beyond it. I think this moving on is important and it's it's really important also to have this, this blameless culture and, and say that, as you said, Lars, the first aspect is fixing the problem, maybe dealing with... with um, um, collateral damage uh, around that and then trying to avoid uh, similar problems in the future but it's not finger pointing and saying hey this is your responsibility you did something wrong that's might be helpful to to figure out what the problem is but it should be avoided uh, in in the end we we are one team that is trying to fix the problem um, and trying to limit the, the impact of, of the, this um, attack or this vulnerability that was well exploited. Definitely, definitely. I think engineers always want to achieve what is best and, and to focus on, um, on finding then, uh, the best solution going forward instead of looking back at what was the original cause is, is often the best way forward. Mm -hmm. And before we wrap up our conversation... Let's also mention a bit AI. So it's a buzzword that it's all over the place these days, right? Especially with ChatGPT and other advanced AI tools. And um, we know that they bring new challenges for data privacy, for security. But could you tell me, could AI be used to help with secure coding? Yeah, for sure. I mean, there are tools um, available that help with writing code or also reviewing code that is specifically focused on secure coding. Um, so things like um, co-pilots and, and AI um, development tools and so on. But it's really important that they focus on, on secure coding because there are also been incidents where, where the code that was generated is, is not secure, has, has vulnerabilities in it. Um, so we want to learn from code that is the way it should be and not from, from code that people actually write out in the field. So that's a really important aspect that it's there. But these tools are there. Also review tools that you can integrate into your CI CD pipelines. Those are really helpful and, and can automate a lot of things when it comes to finding um, security issues in your code. Yeah, and, and I think as well, the other aspect, of course, is that uh, whenever a new technology emerges like that, it can be used for good, but it can also be used uh, for evil. So that's also what we see now, right? Uh, the bad guys also have access uh, to these AI tools. And there's a lot of evidence that shows that uh, they are also being used for all kinds of malicious practices. Uh, the obvious things are obviously also for phishing or uh, video and voice um, and manipulation uh, but also there, I'm, I'm confident that AI will also pose new challenges to security engineers um, that we will have to solve. Well, thank you both for joining me in today's episode. Thank you for inviting us, Ivana. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Tech Tribe, in which we explored secure and responsible software engineering. We hope you enjoyed hearing from Corsen and Lars about secure coding, essential tools, and fostering a supportive development environment. Remember, creating a secure and trusting culture is key to growth. Stay tuned for more insights and tips in our upcoming episodes. Remember to subscribe. I'm your host, Ivana Paskoska. Until next time, keep coding securely. Mm -hmm.